Góðan daginn. Verið hjartalega velkomin á þannig að við brófina kerfa og adópi. Í dag mun Antti Kappinan, finnskur ljósmyndari, margverlunar, sýna ykkur takta sína. Og mér langar að nota þetta tækifæri til að benda ykkur á heimasíðu opina kerfa þar sem að við erum með framleiða einmitt að dópi kennsluefni. Það er frýr aðgangur að þessu efni og sá sem er að taka upp hérna í salinum, Ólafi Kristjánsson, hann framleiðir og býr til þetta efni. Og þessi kennslusíðu okkar er gangvirk þannig að þið getið farið inn á hann og beðið um að eitthvað ákveð efni sér framleitt. Og við reynum að koma til móts við ykkur. Ég held að sé ekki eftir neina að býða og mér langar að bjóða Antti Kappinen. Velkomin í bóndu. Við góða skemmtun. So, good morning everybody. This is really good sized audience. I'm really happy to be here first time in Iceland actually for me. Uh, it's been on my bucket list. Uh, you know you have your bucket list that go, you want to go somewhere and this has been on my bucket list and uh, photography and education has taken me past three years in these weird, weird places and now I'm here so I can kind of uncheck the Iceland experience which I'm going to try to experience tomorrow and on Saturday. Hopefully the wind will slowly calm down. It's been kind of a overwhelmingly windy. Um, I, um, I'm going to talk about um, creativity and also like retouching as a, when you're doing these kind of a lectures, I, um, I know that this is, this is an audience that is, some might be an uh, artist and someone be a marketing and so I, tr I try to always to find that kind of material that everyone finds something out of it because you, you cannot be like specific, specific uh, unless it's only like photographers so I know that there's a different kind of a group here, so the, the whole, uh, this lecture will be varying from retouching techniques to, uh, to also to creativity. So I'm, I'm really happy to be here and thank you for the uh, Adobe and Open Carefit to organize these, uh, this event anyways. Uh, and it's been so far really excellent time. And any time you have questions, just raise your hand. I, I want to say that Finnish people are the shyest people to, you know, raise their hands. So I, I wish that this audience will be a different, so I can go back to Finland and say that, yes, Finnish people are the shyest people. They, they ask questions, so please make a difference. So I, I know it's, it's always like really hard to t just raise your hand, but if you have any questions, for example, this first part, uh, just raise, it's more interesting even for me to kind of channel this conversation to some other direction that I didn't think of. So, um, so a bit of uh, me first. Um, you will see me always wearing a cap and red shoes. I don't have any other colored shoes than red and a cap. So that's in a way be became a, uh, some kind of a, anyways, a brand of mine. Um, I've done quite a weird stuff over the years. Um, I started being a uh, web page developer around 95 when I started my first company. And then um, 97, 98, I basically found myself that, okay, computer science and uh, programming is not my thing, but the computers are, but I, I want to create art, art with them. So um, I studied uh, graphic designing and art direction in, in States for one year. And when I came back, uh, we started this uh, mobile gaming company that we were the first, basically, uh, companies in the world doing mobile games. So we're talking about 98, 99, when the mobile games went, all the gaming anyways, went to the back to the Stone Age. We, uh, people who lived remember these worm games with the Nokia and text-based games and stuff like that. So we were in the, and WAP and... And so I was doing these graphic icons for uh, mobile phones and so over the years I've always do, done like graphic designing or art direction or being a, some kind of a content development manager in our, my own companies. And, um, but I started uh, photography around 2002, like more, when the first proper digital cam cameras came. And I started immediately doing stock photography. So 
every, I took pictures of everything that moved or didn't move, and I, I put it in the stock image banks and basically funded all my gear through these uh, stock images. And um, 2008, um, well, you guys definitely know the de depression on that time, but the same happened all over Europe also, but um, our company started to move, um, like giving our um, work to someone else, and I didn't feel that I'm doing stuff for myself. And since I had already the camera, the photography as an industry is really easy. You have a camera and you decide I'm a photographer, so then you can be a photographer. So that's what I did. I quit my own company and, and made a business card saying that, okay, I'm a photographer now. And, but I started as a portrait photographer and I slowly turned, because of my background of doing creative, uh, creative stuff, I turned into the commercial side. And then the past, Four years, I've been doing a lot of, lot of workshops. I've been touring all over Europe, uh, educating photographers and other creatives uh, how to do these kind of pictures that I do. Um, uh, I do live workshops, uh, smaller groups, bigger groups. Uh, I have my own online learning platform. I've been on tour with Adobe. Um, three weeks ago, one of these weird moments, I was um, doing a creative workshop at Google New York. And like, this is the things that just makes your mind that how on earth I managed to be here. Like this imposter syndrome that you, you think that, what, what? You're in this one of the most innovative companies in the world and I'm from the middle of Finland. So you, you might get that imposter syndrome sometimes. Um, Adobe Stock, I'm, I'm the influencer. Uh, Elin Chrome ambassador, Fuji ambassador. Uh, Chromalux is a, a, a company that makes my prints. They are metallic prints, and Coilab makes my, my portfolios. So that's a slight background of, of me. Here's a showreel of pictures that I do. So if you look at my pictures, they are kind of a fantasy and conceptual. So that, that's my really kind of narrow niche. I, I don't fit for every single case. Uh, but I, I tend to be uh, really hands-on with clients to come up with concepts and then uh, do something de definitely special. And I have a really distinguished style. It comes from how I light my uh, photography and then, of course, the concepts and how I light, but also the retouching. 
it always goes the same process, so they tend to look in a similar, but that's why uh, they uh, usually the clients that want me, they want my style and the concepts also. So. Uh, social media, uh, my own web page, uh, Instagram, Facebook and YouTube, you'll find a lot of my tutorials and stuff like also on YouTube. And so if you want to post anything on Instagram, just tag me there. So. So I divided this, um, this half-day thing into two parts, because as I said, I want to kind of give something for uh, like everyone. So uh, first I will talk more like on the creative so side of things, that how I come up with my concepts, uh, how, how my process works, um, and also creating extra value. I, uh, I write a lot of content and I do a lot of even though my client might not want it or they don't ask it, but I still write a lot of and, uh, content and create extra value because it is also for me, and but it's also for the client uh, creating something extra. And then I kind of uh, go through a couple of selected stories also, um, how, um, how I kind of approach things. Um, then, the second part, I think we're going to do a small break uh, between these, but then it's like uh, techniques. So this is for some might come only for these. So this is like Photoshop and uh, my best practices uh, when I'm doing these kind of images. I'm pretty sure that there's some bits and pieces for if you're anything doing with Photoshop or uh, doing this kind of a images, I'm, I'm, I'm confident that there's something new from there. Uh, I'm going to do a, like a small demo after these best practices just to show in real life how I approach these images of like technical level. And also I wanted to show another software um, after effects where I just quickly show you the technique how to again comes to this creating more value from still images you are able to do these uh, 3D kind of parallax uh, things. So it's just a quick demo of another Adobe software that um, you might want to search. And again, for your clients, you are able to charge more even if you learn this. So this is something how we can uh, approach this. And so as I already said, please, 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 please ask if you have any questions. And you know, that, that would be, from, from my point of view, it'd be really good. So this is what, what we're going to do today. Um, I want to first uh, cover this, how I, I approach my own work and or client work nowadays. Um, uh, I have my own, in a way, build it in system, how I choose if I want to do a project or not. And it comes to these three, three things, money, portfolio, and network. And, and I need to have two of those always. So money is not, it's me being an artist, money is not something that like moves me in any direction. Nobody is going to pay me enough to do a funeral, for example. So all these are things that I always uh, need and I'm, I'm really happy to do actually uh, pro bono work. Uh, we as a creative, we have sometimes this uh, problem. I think everyone who has done any creative work, you are facing this, that, okay, let's pay you as an exposure. I'm pretty sure that every photographer faces it, that as they will give you exposure. And you, you cannot buy hot dogs with that, those expo <laughs> exposures. Uh, money. So, so who has got paid with exposure and, you know, don't, don't know what to do with that exposure. I'm pretty sure that a um, lot of uh, creatives uh, faces this problem, but I try to tackle this uh, whole thing with this, my, my thinking that the money network and portfolio, as I said, I need two of those always. So if I know that I'm going to do a really good portfolio picture to myself, and I, I will gain networks, that will be overpowering the money, I'm really happy to do it totally free. But these are top selected projects that are, are going, I, I know that they're going to take me further than I would ask. Maybe they don't have the budget. So let's say I'm bidding on a project and 
or my, for example, some, some wants to me to do a project and I know that it would be a 5,000 euros, for example. And, and they, will have, they will say that uh, we will have only 1,000 euros. The money, if I know that I will do an amazing portfolio picture for me, and that will give me a network of people that will get me further away, I'm, I'm okay to cross out the money issue there. But I'm not even going to get, take your 1,000 euros, because uh, in my mind, when you pay me the 1,000 euros, you have already full paid it fully. So I want to leave that 5,000 euros as a, as a debt. So in your mind, you owe me 5,000. It, it, it comes in a certain different ways. If all these works, then I'm in a happy place. It's a good budget, portfolio and networks, that, that is perfect. But sometimes money and portfolio, money and network, those are things, but I always look for two of those things, but individual things uh, doesn't move me. So that's been kind of my thinking of how I approach uh, projects and where, when I'm doing like uh, exposure work. Portfo if the portfolio network are overpowering in my mind the money, I'm okay to just say that don't pay any anything and let's figure out where, where this takes us. But this is just few cases in a year that I um, do like this. So uh, creative concepts, when, I, um, when you look, look at my pictures, they are, most of them are these kind of a conceptual uh, pictures. And since I have a, like a creative background, I, I want to be also involved in it. I, I can work with advertisement agencies, but I can also be a, like an additional brain to come up with new concepts. So the process goes that uh, I'll explain how, where my ideas are born. Uh, then I need to, because uh, I already see the picture quite ready in my mind, already in the idea stage. But then you as a client might have a totally different view on that if it's like written or like abstract. Uh, so I need to transfer my views to you, your head. Only way I can do it is visually, so I do mood boards and like a really, really rough sketches. So this is my uh, process and I, I will show you all these, how these uh, things work for me. So the first thing is how, how to come up with these uh, weird concepts and um, weird pictures uh, that I have created over the years, where the ideas comes from. And this was so liberating for me when I started to say out loud that I'm the biggest kleptomaniac of ideas ever. I, I steal everything from everyone. I, I mean, I collect ideas constantly to my well, like bag of stolen ideas. But for me, it's a, it's, this is the difference. The, the stealing is not the same as copying. Because copying is easy. You see a picture and you copy the similar. But it's... That the whole thing is that you see a picture get inspired and create something different. And this is the stealing part. There's a numerous uh, artists and people that have out loud said this, that, uh, that art is theft. Everything is already invented in some form. So I steal in a way selectively. So whenever I see a picture or newspaper article or whatever, I just pin it to my Pinterest board and I write why I stole it. Because it, hotels are cool because there's such weird kind of art everywhere. So I took a picture and I pin it to a Pinterest that say this, is, this has a nice concept, this has a nice color palette. So I'm not, copy, I'm not saying to me that they create something similar. I'm, I'm looking at something and I want to just steal that idea or concept or color or whatever it is in that and make it, put it in my kind of a bag of stolen ideas. And then these ideas, because I have plenty of them, might initiate this kind of a process in my head that they fit together somehow. Two or three of these things just weirdly kind of a collide. Uh, Picasso has said, good, God, good artist copy, great artist steal. Uh, Steve Jobs was always outspoken uh, about that Apple is stealing the best ideas all over the world. David Bowie, late David Bowie all, said always that the only thing that he will study from art is something where he can steal something. 
So there's a lot of movie directors uh, that have said that they are shameless thieves, because the whole thing is nothing is original in a way. So for me, it, it's been, uh, it was so uh, helpful to start saying out loud that, yeah, I'm going to steal. If you, if you show me something, I'm probably going to steal some, some bits of it. And then when you say to yourself that you, it's okay to steal, then you start to see actually stuff in every single uh, weird pe pe places. So where my ideas co comes from, um, there's a lot of these sources of inspiration. Um, I look a lot of pictures, uh, almost like daily I go to these websites. Uh, Behance, of course, Adobe's uh, web page, uh, it's a really good place because there's a lot of c uh, creative stuff coming all, all, always. It's not f just photography, it's illustrations, logos. So that is a great source. One Island uh, pushes a lot of pictures like daily in there, 500px, 1x, uh, Pinterest and Creative Finder. Those are the websites I, I tend to um, look for quite often. But the, how I look them, if I see a picture, um, I don't just post an information that, that this is something cool. I, I try to write in my Pinterest board why I stole it. What, is, what was the thing in this picture, why, what it in, initiated in, in me? So this is my stealing, in a way, process. Um, but even more my ideas come from reading stuff or watching stuff uh, other than pictures, uh, blogs, movies, articles, music, lyrics, news, surroundings. And in a way, I'm, since I'm okay to steal, I'm walking, looking like, like to, through a tube almost, like things. So if I read a newspaper article, I'm, I'm reading that through the eyes, what I can steal from this article, if it just initiates something cool in my um, mind. So that's been um, always my, part of my uh, creative process to start figuring out how to use these uh, ideas in a different way. And the whole thing is that when I um, want to do a client case, I have a plenty of ideas and they just have to put three, two of these weird ideas together. So anyone here says that they are also stealing ideas? No, now, now we have to have some more hands. Other, otherwise, you're just lying. I think every creative is stealing something. And I, I, I assure you, when you, you liberate yourself saying that out loud, it will open a huge, huge uh, possibilities for you. Because it's, for me, on my point of view, it's okay. It's just okay. Um, here's the one thing, because uh, I, uh, I have plenty of material of uh, creativity, um, how to uh, develop creativity. And well, one of these things is uh, any waste of time. Uh, I always come to, uh, back to this thing that, I don't have the time. I'm pretty sure that every creative here uh, has said out loud that I don't have time to do it. So creativity needs time. That's a one, one definite thing. But um, also, I've noticed that you have to generate, in a, way, in a way, randomness in your thought process to start looking something that you are not, in a way, thinking that, OK, this is uh, what I need to look. So, for me, for example, Wikipedia's random uh, article, there's this button. Uh, and when you press that, it will give you an article that you are not definitely looking for. Definitely not. It could be a, a liver, something like uh, intestines or bugs or sharks. Or So when you are reading something that you are not like forcing you to look for, it creates your randomness in your thought process and that those articles could initiate in your if you're doing a, uh, some kind of a campaign to someone those wh what you read might ele ele elevate that idea into a totally different new level because if you're doing a campaign 
and you start searching, you are usually searching those words that you think that matches that subject. But if, if you add or forcefully add randomness in your thought process just by pressing this button, there could be a totally new addition to that concept again. This has saved me at least a few times in, I think I've, I'm, I'm doing a conceptual uh, art uh, photography pro project and I feel that there's, you know, it's too straightforward. So I go and click and read and at least a couple of times it has opened up like a totally new idea to add on that and it turned out to be, again, something totally original, which it wasn't because nothing is <laughs> original. So, But in, in my mind, I was creating something totally because you are able to create totally random, random stuff in there. So at this idea level that we are, um, as I said, I already see clear, clear picture. Um, I, I usually get these flashes, a uh, lot of airplanes. Um, I do a lot of idea sketch, sketching and ideas in airplanes. I think it's a good place because you are in your own small bubble with your noise cancellation headset and, and then you read these magazines. And for me, this uh, airplane magazine some, uh, has launched a lot of these ideas actually. And use, uh, I usually see them as a flash of image and then I have to sketch it out really fast, not just write, I, ha I have to sketch. But then if I need to transfer the idea for someone, I need to do a mood board and also the sketch. So this is the process of after the idea, I, I have a clear picture. If I close my eyes, I see it perfectly. But I cannot, I cannot explain to you that, okay, this is the idea. So I need to do this. So my mood boards are something like these. So collections of images that, that kind of describes what I'm about to do. So in this case, this was a, one IT company. Um, every single team had an um, option to just feed me information, what will be their future. It was a weird, weird project anyways. But, but this is a mood board for one of these teams. And I'm just collecting that, OK, we will need penguins. Of course, we need penguins. Uh, it should be a, the environment should be like a Disney themed uh, amusement park and there should be a possibility to look under the water like through a glass and maybe there should be a sign of don't feed, feed the animals. So this gives you the reference of frame where we are in this picture and the colors, of course, these bluish tones and, and penguins somewhere and floating these ice, ice things. So then I do a sketch. And from that sketch, the client sees already what I'm about to do. And for me, it's really crucial because I, I can shoot now these things. I, 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 when I go to, photo, uh, to shoot the pictures, there's no error anymore possibilities. Um, I cannot do any mistakes because I, the client has to see the same stuff that I do. Because if I've already taken the headshots and not the full body shots, and now they think that, okay, they didn't want to be a penguins, I'm screwed. So that's why I need to do sketching. A couple of guys over there, one is looking. So from, from mood board, from to sketch to final product, you can see it in the glass uh, under, so additional, uh, the don't feed the penguins came to be like something like that. And, but I already knew every single detail of this picture before I went to uh, take the shot. All my sketches are like this. And people, people usually say that they don't uh, know how to draw. You don't have to draw like this. This is a sketch. I'm, I'm confident that everyone can draw on this kindergarten level. This is a Alice in Wonderland. You can see the cats there floating nicely. And there's a queen of hearts behind that door. And the Mad Hatter and the Alice is th there. So even a crappy sketch like this are guiding you, for example, for me to shoot. How, what is the ho horizon? How, what is the sizes of the elements? Where are, what is the environment? And without this, 
uh, it's impossible for me to shoot according to my concept. So this, uh, even this crappy sketch will guide me that, okay, for example, I can concentrate all, only on the couple first over there, and then maybe on the queen of hearts later, and then just adding the elements. But from this sketch, I already know where the horizon, how I need to shoot it. So this is always that people say that I cannot draw. draw. So if you can draw this, I'm pretty sure you can do sketches. Um, how many of you guys do, do, do anything like these process, like mood boards for clients or, um, or sketching? Um, just a quick, uh, how many like doing art, uh, art direction or graphic designing here? Uh, quite a few. How many photographers? And then other sales, marketing, what, whatever, yeah. Uh, but for everyone, um, I think it's really important for the, the chain to know also what the others are doing, even for, for the marketing to the aid, uh, art direction, uh, graphic designers, because they can, they can communicate better. Because uh, I, I think it's always really important to have a process um, that will guide you. Because... Uh, for example, if you have a process, it's easier to charge people. You can show transparently what goes into the process. Because for me, it's a, people think that photography as an industry is so inflated that I just take pictures. They call them snaps or, you know, it's, it's like ridiculous. So I have always shown the transparency of what goes into the process. So that's why I'm able to also charge uh, more than the guy that just goes and takes a shot. So these are the things that uh, are always embedded in my process to have a process. Uh, sketches guide me to shoot. Uh, this was for, for one client, so I might go a couple of days before on the location and see with the client, so okay, this is the environment. So there's a guy with a rabbit coming out of the hat, maybe he's a towel. Uh, I'm just making notes also to myself Remember to put light here. Should this be open? Put the jeans here. What is the angle here? So the client sees this and agrees. This is the shot we are going to do, but with the, with the talent. So, from, so this is how, how clear it is for me. I, I, I try to visualize everything. Because then I'm able to just concentrate on these guys first and then they can leave, and then they can just leave, uh, light the environment secondly. Or the same campaign, um, another sketch. Um, remember to put the runner here. Maybe we will double the hand weights. There's a bow tie martini bond guy here. Is there an interaction between? But still, you are able to see the elements, and the client can agree that, okay, this is the angle, this is the shot we're going to do with these people. So really, really important. And this is actually the stage where I spend the most of my time uh, uh, making the mood board, making the sketches, uh, coming up with the concepts. Because after these I have done uh, properly, the photo shoot and retouching is it's pretty easy after that. So here's a couple of cases of these, uh, how my thinking process uh, goes from idea. Um, here's one case. This is my own project, actually. Um, I read an article about uh, sailboats and their figureheads. These, uh, and so I started to research that w what was the purpose of those. So I started to Google them and collecting mood boards um, and why they had a do dove or a bird that the, the woman or something is releasing and what was the purpose of these. And, I, I found out that the, the Vikings also used the, the bird to release it, and that birds were taught to fly a certain distance to look, look for land. And so if they found land, they would stay, of course, there. But if they didn't find land, they came back. So that's why if, if, um, So these are the things that started to guide me that um, I want to do this kind of a uh, project. But I, I wanted to uh, picture uh, like a couple uh, as a sailboat. So this was an airplane sketch. I wanted to have a, a ballet dancers uh, to, uh, to be at the figurehead and then the mast and the, the sail in the stormy ocean 
kind of a figuring that it's a, it's a relationship, it's a stormy relationship that are flowing through the ocean and releasing the dove. So I started to research again uh, the fabrics and the poses with my, yes, my toys, not my son's toys. And I wanted this flowy material. Um, and then the final uh, picture. I have a small video of that process. With that, you see the process of uh, even it was my own uh, kind of a project, how it evolved from a concept of just starting to look for these figureheads. Um, then another, uh, this is a case um, um, that has a lot of this uh, additional content that I, I always try to deliver. This is my friends. Uh, a beer company, the company is called Rock, Paper, Scissors. And I came up with the kind of a concept of, because uh, the, the founders are three guys, uh, they are like childhood friends. And when they are figuring out what they would call their brewery, they just noticed that we have we'll always been battling with Rock, Paper, Scissors. So that became their company and the whole brand. Every time you open the cork of the beer, there's a Rock, Paper, Scissors logo in the cork. So you can play with your friends that who's going to pay the round. And I came up with the concept that, okay, let's do these three guys, that everyone loses a one battle in a way. So this was the first, first idea. One is taking a tattoo in his ass, and the other two guys are just cheering here. And again, actual location, crappiest crap uh, sketch, but still guided me to shoot like that. Then the, another one, designated driver. I think we all been hit here. Who's gonna be the driver? Just as a rough sketch, two in the back seat drinking. The other guys like, oh crap! I need to drive with these guys. And then the result. And then the third one, who's gonna pay the bill? Two guys just over the top because they won in the lottery almost and the other guy is just not happy, and then the... So from these, these are really easy to, if you know my style, and what the, the client sees exactly what the picture will be. And so this was the... Uh, but this was a really funny case, because uh, uh, we did a lot of extra, um, extra material uh, out of this. So first we did this uh, cinema craft that I will show you the last uh, bit, I will show you the technique. Even though it was a steel production case, we were able to make uh, the company video um, uh, advertisement clips. <laughs> So really cost-effective way, again, to create more content, and you, you are able to charge more of the same case. But again, creating content is something really funny, because uh, you don't know what of these videos will be uh, good. So I decided, because uh, I shoot maybe 400 frames for each, lo each location, and I used like only a few frames of those, and I have these extra frames. So I decided that, hey, I'm going to put all these frames that I didn't use 
on this one video, and I created this. And this was the most shared video of, of the whole. <laughs> yeah, we had to eat that we had to eat before we started the shootings so, and and the guys were drinking too, so really authentic, I would say. But this is again uh, one of these things that uh, minimum effort. You know, few hours just to put these videos together and maximum result in a way. So this is always that uh, I, my I, my thinking goes always how I'm able to create extra content or value through these uh, even this video or content. Um, I'm going to go through just the uh, example process uh, again. This is kind of a um, uh, one of my latest ideas that just initiated in an airplane. Um, I was reading this um, airplane magazine of this uh, largest cleanup in the history of this, because there's this garbage floating in the, in, the, uh, in the ocean, and this one young guy invented this process of how they can clean up all the... And then, uh, some weeks uh, before this, I, I bought Oculus Go, these uh, VR glasses, and for some reason, uh, when I was reading this, and, you know, there's a lot of in the news anyways, how, how we as a generation are turning this uh, uh, planet into this uh, garbage uh, disposal uh, landfill. These somehow connected in my, my brain. And I immediately sketched out in an airplane this. A concept that will be a beach. And this is like a reality, looking, back, looking forward like 30 years maybe that we have already ruined every single, it's like uh, factories and everything is like filled with uh, bottles and, and there's this one guy looking at these uh, virtual glasses and there's a table full of them and it says that you can, you can rent them for hour. And this is the alternate reality when the people have bought these and put them on, like a family looking at the sunset, because hopefully not in the future we need to put these glasses on such to see the sunset, for example. I don't want to go there, but this was my idea that uh, hopefully this will initiate some kind of a uh, thought process in people. So I wanted to include also my, um, my own lake uh, where I live uh, close by. So I went there and just checked the angles and stuff. This was the ready picture. And there's, now there's a couple, and it says that you, you are able to rent them for 39, hour, 39 euros per hour. Well, that's me, actually. The whole family is there. My kids uh, are playing there. But this is really weird to see sometimes how accurate my sketches are. Because I can see that uh, I saw exactly that, and that's the crappy sketch, but this is the result after three months. So this is how... That's why it's really important for me to sketch out exactly on the spot, because I, I don't remember anymore. 
So I need to do, I travel with always this Moleskin um, notebook because uh, I like the analog. I don't want to draw in di digital. I just want to draw uh, really quickly. So this is exactly the process that a uh, couple of ideas, the Oculus Go and the re reading newspaper article initiated this thing in my, and I was able to sketch out that which turned out to be this. So this is the, exactly the thought process that I go through always. Here's another kind of a thought process how, how my kind of a my mind uh, works. Um, this was a time when I was in Wales. Uh, no, this was actually before. Uh, this was a Pinterest board. Um, I, I collected these images that has this forced perspective that you turn the picture upside down and you place the person in, in a weird way there so it looks like it's an alternate reality. Almost uh, looks like impossible. So I wanted to explore this sometime. Uh, so this was my Pinterest board. I, I really like the forced perspective concept. Um, I wasn't doing weddings anymore at the moment, but then there was a, was a couple that insisted to have a shoot with, with me. And then they said that you will have a free hands, do whatever you feel like it, and we will give you just a list of movies. And on that list, there was a movie called Inception, that is a movie by Leonardo, Leonardo DiCaprio, where in the dream world, the perspective changes. So I was like, hey, now I can explore this, my forced perspective thing. Um, so I came with the story of a magician and an assistant doing a magic show uh, in this bar. And the last frame of that uh, four pictures, I did only four pictures for them, was this. So I, I turned the whole bar upside down. Um, so this was this is a wedding picture, and uh, so this picture was different enough from wedding pictures that it got me a, a World Cup bronze medal 2013, I think. Um, a couple in black in bar, but it's one of these things that, uh, especially when you're doing competitions, competitions are judged by you see something different or not. You change it as different, change uh, uh, next picture. So this will go, people go like this. So this is enough to make a difference on all the other pictures to make it to the next level in a way. And then you start looking what is going on in this picture. The hardest part was to figure out how to put the bouquet actually, because the gravity has to go in a way uh, sideways. Uh, but again, I thought there's more to this uh, forced perspective thing. So I stored it back to my stolen ideas. I, uh, I wanted that I wanted to do something even more different with it. And uh, now I was in back in Wales and there was this one artist um, called Jamie Harris that wanted me to do a record cover. And he said that you'll have again free hands. That's, that's my cue always that you have free hands because then they don't have a say basically. And so that's why I, okay, I'm going to do the forced perspective thing, and I started to travel, uh, walk Cardiff, uh, the capital of Wales, like this, like trying to look where I'm going to put the forced perspective, looking like an idiot, and and I I've, I've been walking past this like a long, many, many, many times, and didn't see anything cool about this until now, when my mind is set to see something cool in this. Now I walk past this, past this, and I said, "Oh my God, that's a huge letter J," and the artist is. Jamie Harris, and this was like a couple of days after I was uh, got the project. I took the picture, sketched, I turned it, but the whole my thought was that I don't want people to go like this. I will redraw the horizon so people just accept that, that that's the actual location. So that was a shot, and nobody is going to ask me that it was shot in the back. Everyone is asking where is that location and how did you get the guy over there? Because of the horror, they don't... So this was again, the concept from forced perspective changed over the times and I, I just did something uh, more of my, my style. Show you a quick video of this. This was really weird photo shoot anyways. You can see from here, me shooting the... I tasted a lot of different locations in this one. What did you believe in then? Where did it all go wrong? And where are you now? The fortunes that never came Nobody else to blame Except for you 
to be um, one thing that I always try to especially photographers that they don't they usually just post pictures in Facebook and, and then they wish that they will get these thumbs and then their mom will like it and but I try to like when I do a project even a client case or even my own I, I try to get at as much of different content so it becomes like tangible in different medias and that will draw more eyes because you don't know what will happen. So here's a one story that explains why, for example, I write a lot of content. Um, I have one friend, this is Marco, he makes these miniatures. That's a seven centimeter high diorama miniature. So he's really good with those and I took a picture of his uh, miniatures and I wanted to create art my style or from that but I wanted to superimpose his head on this on this mi miniature then I write a story a blog about how cool it is to collaborate with different kind of artists I'm a digital artist he's uh, doing a miniatures I think over like if you're crossing to different arts you're able to uh, do even more cool stuff because uh, this is his art this is my art and together we are more than we are in, as individuals. So that was the story. It wasn't about the picture, it was about my friend, that I'm really happy to have that kind of a talent uh, and create stuff. So I write a content, one big photography blog uh, published it, um, and then after the publishing, uh, uh, 15 minutes, and I will get the first email from Digital Photo Magazine, which is a, uh, one of the biggest uh, UK-based, just a print magazine. And it says that we saw your article, uh, we want to publish that story in our magazine, we will pay you 200 pounds for it. I was like, yeah. And then 15, uh, another 20 minutes goes and the same, it was the main editor of the magazine, says, says to me an article that, oh, I went to your web pages, um, it's, it's useless to do only for, from this, we will do a feature of you. So now I will have on that print magazine six pages. Now I have a direct contact on the main editor of the biggest print magazine in the UK, saying that I can write you more. Well, I had, a I had a monthly column after that. There's no money I can buy this exposure. <laughs> and they named me a Photoshop editing ninja Photoshop. So I can every month tell one of my pictures to a perfect audience. One blog post. So this is a, hopefully this will initiate these things, how important it is to write the content. Um, the how, and how I approach, um, it's, it's not always, uh, or usually it's not, not about the picture, it's about the why I created it. As in the, in the previous, uh, it was about why it was the, about my friend. And Nobody, I, I, I say, nobody is interested about me. I live in the freaking middle of Finland. Nobody is looking always like, what is Antti doing? Nobody's. I'm sending them out every single time using those forms that every big, uh, blog magazine have, or if I have straight contacts, every single blog, you have to send them um, 
they are not going to uh, come and look for your, your material. But it's really important to have a, like a heading in your mind. What is the, what would be a, think about it, it's a clickbait. The heading has to be interesting. And you can do a project along also on that line. One, another example was pro this project. Um, my wife uh, turned 40 and we thought that we we're going to do a, a project uh, with her um, uh, to dress up her as a, a Viking slageretta. So I bought, um, we collected money from friends, uh, we bought a real one-to-one -one replica of the armor. Uh, she has already a one-eyed horse, like a proper Odin horse, uh, hired a makeup artist, a videographer to do the behind-the-scenes footage. And it wasn't about the, the, the blog I posted, it wasn't about the pictures itself, like Luke the Vikings pictures. It was about the birthday present I gave to my 40-year-old uh, wife. And it spread everywhere. Of course, I post it, and I, Twitter and Instagram are great because I can hashtag and put the ad sign to HBO. Look at my work. This is the only way you can engage conversations with these big companies is just to do similar projects and put, lean your shoulder against them and say, that, look at my work. Maybe, maybe they will... It was, they were posted in every single bigger blog. Uh, HBO tweeted. Even the actor Catherine Winnick posted a picture. He has now like uh, many million of followers. So again, I don't know where this has taken me, but this picture has been seen. Uh, and I'm allowing me to have a possibility that someday HBO, Nordic even, might contact me. Hey, that was the guy we tweeted actually that did this Vikings poster. Without that, they don't even know that I exist. So this is my thinking about how to associate yourself with the brand even though the brand doesn't know about you. So here's a, a perfect case of content. And again, we created, a, um, uh, from this project, we created a behind the scenes video, uh, actually a couple of times, and also this fake trailer when, when the, uh, the new season came out, and people thought it was real. Do you need a king to be a queen? I've seen the end. I know how the walls crumble down and fire burns everything with it. For it was me who was burning. When all you have left is your pride. And then you lose that too. When all of the pain is real. And your heart is your weakness. But you see, I don't care if I fall. For I will rise again. To hide. But this time, the hurt won't be yours. This is not a warning. For I don't want you to run. The guards will decide. This has been seen in different med medias for two, three hundred thousand times. It was just a bit of our behind the scenes footage, and that just that. Lifting the head was shot in a studio, and uh, my wife made the, the story, the narration, and she just talked. Minimum effort, maximum result, again. So, so um, that concludes, in a way, the first um, part, actually. So we'll take a five minute uh, break, bit of a coffee, and then we'll start doing the more technical side of uh, things. And uh, I'll be here anyway, so uh, usually people are that they, if you, if you don't want to ask, just come and talk to me after or during this break or even so. Okay, I, I start slowly. Uh, so now we're um, heading for the Photoshop part. What do you thought about the first part? I think it's always more, more important, this creative part, than these techniques, because this you can learn anywhere, but this opening the mind. How, what are your thoughts about the first part? 
Did you feel any inspiration or, and will change anything on your processes? Just a few comments anywhere. Yeah. Yeah, Wikipedia random but buttons. Everyone is going to. What is? Yeah. Yeah, please do. Everything here is for grabs, so. It, it would be also in video, so. So this will, anyways, because now we're going to go into the Photoshop part. These, some of these techniques, um, I, can go, I cannot go too slow just to get uh, done, but luckily it will be in video, so you'll, uh, you are able to follow up these uh, techniques uh, later on. But uh, hopefully there's uh, plenty of these for, for you guys. Uh, how many of uh, here is doing any kind of this kind of composite uh, work that putting uh, different pictures into get together? Oh, that's good. So plenty of um, different kinds. So hopefully there's a lot of, uh, at least some, something new in this, because uh, um, um, I'm different in a way that, because I'm a kind of old school uh, Photoshop guy. I, I, I've used Photoshop for 24, 23 years. I started with 2.5 and three was the first layers. Uh, so my techniques are sometimes kind of old school, uh, and I'm, I'm one of these complaining always when Adobe brings some new features that takes away from my old best practice tools. So, but then again, when I'm teaching, I, I try to adapt also to the latest, uh, latest stuff also. But the stuff that I'm always like showing is the be best practice things. I don't usually show the latest of the latest um, what is up and new with Adobe. I, I'm practical. I, I try to give you tools that will help you better. And, and I don't mind also complaining if there's something wrong. I'm not that corrupted Adobe guy yet. So I'm, I'm OK to complain also. Um, <clears throat> so uh, as you can see from my pictures, I do a lot of uh, composite images. Um, and over the years, I have developed these. I, I needed to develop these kind of a practices that makes my life easier. Um, for example, when, it, when I'm doing a perspective things, or especially colors and shadows or uh, sizing things, I need to figure out how, how these work. So over the years, I have developed my process, and that turned into be, in a way, techniques that uh, can be taught in this matter. So first, we're going to do a composite image uh, best practices. And Always, um, when you're doing composite images, um, I think these are the, f the five, five issues are always that I try to look for. So first is perspective, then where the, is, is the horizon in the picture, what size are the elements, are the colors matching if you're, addition, you're uh, putting together uh, images that are different sources, uh, not shot in the same uh, locations, and, and then how to extract shadows. So this is the... Uh, kind of that we would cover all these things and how to kind of deal with them. So the first perspective and in a way perspective and horizon goes in the same, same uh, kind of a, um, area. So let's take the dude uh, away. Um, so someone says how this was shot, this back plate. Anyone? Yeah, how? No, no, no. <laughs> that was, I think, the best joke I, I almost didn't get. So. Um, but anyways, it's really low up. So as you can see, it's, uh, th think about horizon, that uh, when you look at the sea, you uh, shoot waist level straight up, the horizon is in the middle. You tilt your camera down, horizon is up, you tilt your camera up, the horizon is in the in the bottom. So this is shots really, really low up. So really kind of a wide um, and wide angle lens. And this is the thing that we can also determine where is our horizon in this picture. Because it's really important to know the horizon because always the elements that you are going to put together, the horizons should, should match. So we can follow um, even this room, this is a uh, rectangular shaped room. If I take a picture of this room and I follow that edge of the line over there, that 
And for example, that they meet in my picture in this one point called vanishing point, and there's my horizon, however I shot it. All those, the, the, the parallel lines goes into one uh, point called vanishing point, and there's a horizon. So I can, from this picture, if I know that, for example, this pipe and this railing are going in the same direction, they are pa parallel to each other, I can just draw, for example, a guiding lines for me. So I will follow that line and I follow that railing. And then they meet here, and here's our cross section. Here's our horizon in this picture. So if you find two parallel lines in your, in your picture and follow them, you find your vanishing point, and you can use that to your benefit. So the horizon in this picture, you can see that it's, it's really low up. So what if we have this guy here? Looks really natural to place here, right? So as I said already, the horizons has to match. And if this would be the situation that I have shot my back plate like that, and I would need to put this guy here, yeah, I would be in a world of trouble. Because this guy, if I open it, it's a smart optic, so I'm going to open it up. And I'm just going to make a, I know that this was shot waist level straight up. So the horizon is somewhere around here. So the only place where this guy would look real in this environment is that when the horizon and the horizon will match. So I would need to put him here. And if this, this would be my situation, I would be in a... In a so again, to, to determine the horizons beforehand to shoot is really important. And always when I uh, say that people are starting to do composite images, just shoot waist level straight up, middle horizon. You will find the most pictures, if you go into stock images, middle horizon, not wide angle, don't make your life really hard. Shoot all your elements middle horizon. So this is, the, this is the situation. Here's another example. For example, this, you can see that it doesn't fit. Um, if the person or the elements you are adding uh, you can see the feet. Feet gives off the perspective easily, how they are. You can see that they are not even closely matching this uh, environment, how they are. Um, so we can check actually where this picture's horizon is. So this is, I've already cut out. But you can see that it's a studio shot. And again, I'm certain that this edge of this font, this paper, and for example the lamp here, they are parallel, they are going the same direction. These are two parallel lines. So I can follow those and there's a cross section, there's a vanishing point, and then here's our horizon. Her horizon, how it was shot, is, it's there. So again, only place she would look somewhat natural would be that the horizon would match the horizon. As you can see, if I put her there, she looks. And if you don't see the feet, you, there's a lot of this uh, kind of a giveaway of the perspective, how you can fool the eye. But when you see the feet, the whole body shot, then you, are, you have to have the perspective kind of right. So this is the first thing, the perspective um, and the horizon. The horizons should match always. And when I do a demo of uh, kind of a quickly building an environment, you will see how this, this horizon thing uh, will work. So this is a one, uh, the horizon and the perspective, really, really crucial. And I cannot emphasize more, shoot middle horizon if, if that's if you're beginning. Or if you want to shoot that, shoot the back plate first and then shoot according to that perspective. There's no way, uh, of course you can distort stuff and later on, but it will be much more easier to do it that way. So perspective and horizon. Then comes the size. Let's open up, for example, here. So let's deal first this kind of a thing of the sizing. So I have a picture here um, of New York and I have already isolated this one car here this one and I can do somewhat okay guessing that if I would need to place 
like an extra car here. Now it's a bit tiny, I think. I can do a bit of guesstimating what sized it should be. I can do roughly okay job with this, but we don't need to guess. This is where the vanishing point uh, comes into play that we, we are able to find also in this picture. So if I follow a couple of parallel lines, because I know this street is straight. So I'm just going to follow for example, that line over there and the end of this, this road. They're going to meet here in the cross section. There's our horizon. And in the cross section is the vanishing point. So now I have this car that is already uh, separated a cutout. Command T, put the transform tool. And in the uh, latest version of uh, Photoshop, they have actually lost this, uh, this middle point. Now they are, uh, you have to put it together. But normally in the previous version, it was like this, and nobody knew what to do with this annoying dot here in the middle. Right? You, you, if you, you, you drag this, you will put it here, and usually you'll even drag it back before you start doing anything. So I'm pretty sure that this is what, what Photoshop. But now, because we we, in the latest Photoshop, you have to put it on back, back here. And now we're going to drag this dot, annoying dot, to the vanishing point that we have in our, uh, in our scene. Uh, latest version, you needed to press Shift and Option. But now the Shift, the scaling, is uh, without the Shift in the latest version. Now I can just press Option and look. It's always in the right size. This is something you can copy. For if you have a lamp, for example, you can copy it all the way through in the right size. You don't have to guess what is the size. And the same with another, this another car here. I have this isolated. Command T, put the vanishing point, this annoying dot to the vanishing point. Option, click, and drag. It's always in the right. According to this world. Because now we, it scales according to this world. Show you another example. So, so for example, here. Uh, I have isolated, for example, that barrel here. <laughs> I can follow this edge here, and for example, the, the wiring here, they are parallel. So in that cross section, that the vanishing point is here. So I choose the barrel. This annoying dot goes to the vanishing point, option, and drag. Was, was it new for someone? Yeah. Did you find that helpful? That's been always like, didn't know that exists. Now, there's at least one use for that freaking dot. <laughs> OK, these are examples uh, when we have the elements already in the picture and we know the sizes, right? But the problem is that we are usually bringing elements to these pictures that wasn't there already. So how, how the, we're going to determine that? So I will show you an example. So let's figure out this. Um, well, actually, I'll show you from that. So now I have a landscape picture where there's this dude again. So the whole idea is first, of course, try to find a vanishing point in this. So you find a couple of parallel lines, that line over there, and the, maybe the edge of the street, and those rooftops, they all go in the one, uh, one place. There's the horizon. So in this case where I have this guy here, first I have to figure out a place where I can be kind of sure that he would be that sized. And then I can use the scaling the method. So I'm placing this guy next to that car over there. And thinking that if he would be standing there, he would be somewhat that sized. It could be a, you know, I could uh, even the lid of the um, this one or whatever you are. 
you need to have a reference that you think that, okay, the door is two meters, the guy is 190, place it there, and then use the vanishing point to scale. So now, if I'm kind of sure that, okay, this would be our guy's location, this sized in this world, now I can scale. Scale, this annoying dot goes to the vanishing point, option, click, and scale. And now I can, because in this way it doesn't change the perspective, uh, the, so I can just drag it. And you can see the horizons matches also. Uh, so this is something that could help you to uh, determine the size of elements. Um, but the problem is that if you don't have any reference, like a, just a plain landscape uh, without any parallel lines, trees, there's no way you can find a vanishing point in that but you will find a horizon and try to match at least the horizons. So hopefully this will help you to uh, um, size these things better. So again, this is what just one of these best practices that will, will hopefully guide you um, to do better composite images. So now we have covered basically the perspective size and color, uh, perspective horizon and size. So, so next, up will go to the colors. And this is something that I, I constantly see when people are doing co uh, composite images that um, this is one of these techniques that I wish I knew three years ago because I'm going to my back, my old composite images and, and using this technique and I was like, come on, they're not even close. And it's, it's like this technique has taken my pictures um, Definitely to the, uh, like, way better when I uh, learned this one. Uh, the problem is that uh, here's the two pictures, for example. Here's a, the, the main picture has shot uh, in this, like, a really, with flashes. Flashes, uh, cold light. You can see the shadows, and it's an um, evening shot anyways. You can see that all the shadows are blue. That, that suit is gray, but now it's bluish gray. So I have cut out like just a basic cutout, and I would need to replace that into that background, which is a really warm, warmish toned background. And for some, this looks okay. Hey, that looks okay. For me, it, it's like far from okay. And since your eyes are not trained to see that good like saturation differences or color differences, uh, there's a way that would, um, these help layers helps you to see better. So I've developed these kind of a help layers that kind of a guides you to see better what you're doing or what, how different is the main image from the other. So the technique goes um, that, so now we have these two layers here. And on top of that, I will pray, uh, put a neutral gray layer. So a blank layer, shift backspace, gives fill dialog, and contents 50% gray. And that layer goes into luminosity. What this gives is, in a way, the luminosity map of the value of the colors. And I always emphasize that by putting a hue saturation slider all the way up just to see better. And now you can see how different they, these two images are, actually. This is the, um, just to help you to see so much better. So now I can color grade this, this image. Just looking at this image, you're kind of go going like you don't see the results until you uncheck those. But it's, it's a weird magical moment when you do this. So. Uh, there's a couple of ways how to color grade or fix these. Uh, I usually use a color balance. So uh, actually selective color. So I go to selective color and I need to clip it, make a clipping mask just to affect that car layer. So now whatever I do, it doesn't affect this lower layer here. So now from white neutrals and blacks, I'm need, I need to start fine-tuning this image. Basically just looking this almost like infrared uh, heat camera. And 
uh, you can do like first, I, I usually start with neutrals because most of the colors are in the neutral. Uh, the shadow uh, colors, of course, and the highlights have its own colors. Uh, but usually the, when you modify the neutrals, uh, you, are, you are able to get quite far already. So the thing is that you just move these sliders and of course you have to know that um, on the opposite side, this is bringing more yellow, opposite side of yellow is blue. So this is just to kind of know what the cyan, magenta and yellow are doing. So you just start tweaking and kind of eyeballing what needs to be done in here. So definitely this needs more yellow. So the goal is to make basically this to almost like vanish into the background. So you do, in a way, these movements. You can see that now, okay, well, something happened. Now it started to blend. I think that might be for the neutrals. Let's switch to the blacks. Let's bring more these orangey things into the shadows. And you can do deep, big movements, so you can see what is, it's kind of a doing. I think that might be okay. And then the whites, and you, you can always uncheck to see where the highlights are. So in the shirt and here in the other, you can see it's a yellowish green. So I'm gonna kind of aim for those kind of a tones in there too. Now you can see that they are starting to look similar. So if you, let's not fine tune that, anymore. But if you see that we started from this, it's screaming different. And now you, you kind of squint your eyes, you see that they started to be similar color palettes, and now you uncheck these. Look the change from that to here. Because in that environment the gray suit turns into a warmish gray. So this is the only way I've, I've noticed that I can almost like blindly go fine tune these image using these two check layers. It's, it's one of these weird magic moments that you think that, okay, maybe it's not, maybe it is, or, uh, and then you just uncheck these and say, oh, yes, now. So this is a good starting point now to color grade these two images together. Again, they will blend it in, in more. So this has been one of the, I think, most important techniques that I have um, kind of figured out. I'll just show you a quick example how the, it's weird to kind of fool the eye. Uh, for example, this picture. For some, it might look just fine. I can color grade these together, these uh, layers, but no, it's not even close. Neutral gray layer, luminosity, hue saturation, all the way up. Now you can see how different it is. So I can color grade this Jack Sparrow here, selective color, clip it. Let's start with neutrals. I think there's a most um, in this image anyways in the neutrals. You can kind of quickly see that how it's going to turn out. Even this, that change. I don't, I don't go even to the blacks or now. So mid-tones, and you can see if you squint your eyes, it almost like vanishes there. We started from that. And now I uncheck these two layers. Look how it blends. <laughs> it's like a reddish film almost on top of this. And now it just... Have, have anyone seen this technique or, or... Do you find this useful? So this is, this is something that makes your composite work like stand out. Um, another thing um, that is really, really hard to uh, you to see is saturation. Um, saturation is one of these things that um, when you look at pictures, um, this is was weird thing that I have to figure out this. When I was trying to replicate this one particular look, uh, shade of grass, 
that I saw in one, one photographer's pictures, and I couldn't figure out what was that made that grass look a certain way. I was like trying to figure out the colors and, and tweaking only the colors, and, and then I uh, figure out this, and I noticed that it's a saturation thing. Again, because I cannot see from these two images which one is more saturated than the other. The saturation is really hard to uh, see. So again, if these helps you to fine tune these shades, there's another help layer that helps you to see saturation better. So, so on top of this, so the technique starts on top of this, I will place another selective layer, uh, color layer. I have already a preset here that goes to saturation check. But, but uh, do your own preset from here. But the, how you do it is you start from reds and you pull the blacks to minus 100. Yellows goes to minus 100 in absolute mode. Greens minus 100. Cyan minus 100. Blue minus 100. Magenta minus 100. But then whites plus 100. Neutrals plus 100. Blacks plus 100. Now we have this weird black and white image, but what this is, is a saturation map now. The more lighter, wider colors, the more saturated. So if you look at the guy's face, for example, according to this, this area here, you can see that it's more saturated. It's clear that it's more lighter stage of gray. So now I can just go here and let's put a hue saturation slider. And this is weird because you, as I said, you cannot see how much more saturated the image is. And this guides you. So I can just start dropping and again, clip it only to affect. So you're looking for some of these um, saturation areas here to match these, for example, the background here. And I need to drop actually the saturation of this, for example, this image, minus 36, even more. Now the gray levels start to match. And this is what I would never dare to use by just looking at the image. And again, if I drop this lever now off, look how even better. We, we were like from here to here. So now we have matched the, uh, the colors and now also the saturation. And now, it, now when I color grade this whole group together, they will blend e the saturations and uh, now they blend even more uh, together. Whatever I want to color grade. But the whole thing is that to start with, all these stuff should be aligned. So those are two help layers that um, I totally recommend to kind of uh, check out. And if you have done composite images, you will feel terrible when you put those two layers on. Because you, if you see the cutout like easily, it's like, ah. I thought, uh, before this, I was like just warming, doing the photo filters, like putting some warmth overall but it's the whole key is to put the shadows the tone of the shadows tone of the mid-tones and tone of the highlights they had to be three d separately to match those those tones but this is a huge thing you, now you see the difference it was like this and now the, it's like this and i would never know what to do with the colors without having these couple of help layers just to just guide me that, okay, this is what I need to change. So that is, I think, this part, the colors and the saturation is, it's, um, in my mind, is one of the most important things of, of these uh, composite images. Uh, then we're going to move the shadows. Um, just going to show you a quick example of how I extract shadows. Um, just 
gonna close these. Okay, so we have a now like a really simple that like scene. Again, the same, same, same guy. Um, so we would have a situation that we have a, any kind of a background. We would have a, uh, this guy. I've already, I don't want to waste your time to uh, do any cutting. Um, when, whenever I shoot these kind of a, a composite images, I try to get uh, shadows uh, on the ground, some, at least some parts of the shadows. And the, the shadows that I especially need is called the contact shadows. I, I can always live without the cast shadow. There's, there's actually like three types of shadows. Uh, contact shadow is the, the shadow that is the darkest dark black piece of this small piece of black here where the, the something touches the ground. And that shadow quickly, quickly turns into not black. And this is something that is really, really hard to kind of replicate. And usually when you do it, like a, if you have a standing, like a person, I'm pretty sure everyone has done that. You make a copy out of that, turn that into black, and then just project that into the floor. That's called a cast shadow. That's the secondary shadow that I need. The cast shadow here is this that shows the direction of the light. But here the, 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 draw, the contact shadow is this where it just touches. And this is more important shadow than the cast shadow because this small piece of black ties it to the ground. I can always live without the, the cast shadow. Cast shadow is always easy to project to the direction from the, the, the contact shadow. So that's why I always try to get all at least this part of the shadow, wherever the, the light is. This would be really impo impossible to start to figure out how to generate this. And for example, this odd shape of a person, the cast shadow would be really hard to start blending where it would go. So if I have this kind of shadow information, I can use that um, to my benefit. So, so usually I just cut the person and I cut it all the way through without the shadow first. And here I have the, the, the same layer with, that, with, with the shadow. So what I can do here to get really easily in a way the shadow information from this image is just to make like a selection only from the shadow information Now this layer is behind this um, cutout guy. And I can make a mask out of that. So now the guy is like on a pile of milk. Um, again, uh, blending modes are really important to know in Photoshop, uh, especially certain ones the lighten and darken and multiply, what they does. So in this case, um, when I'm putting this level into multiply, everything that is white basically will be see-through. So let's use that to our, our uh, kind of a advantage. So first, I will try to compress this level, uh, this uh, layer, into more white and more black, in a way. I'm just going to leave the shadow information and get rid of all these uh, neutral grays here. So I'm using a levels, clip it to the, this level layer. So from here, I'm going to squeeze more black. And from this side, I'm going to get rid of the neutral grays, leaving only the shadow information here. Something like that. And when I put this layer now into multiply, I have only the shadows. And I can do a bit of masking if I want to get rid of these.
So this is a one way um, that I usually use. Um, if you have a colored background, turn that first into a, a black and white. Uh, just take the saturation off and then do this, extract the shadows. Uh, but always you have to figure out if this would be a, like a, let's say a wintery scene that we colder shadows. Your shadows has to be color created also to match the shadows. Shadows are not black and white. They are not shades of gray. They are according to that world, what, what kind of light you have there. So this is how I would kind of, if I have this kind of a uh, picture with, um, I would extract the shadows. And now you can see how Actually, I could cut all the way here, all the cast shadows away, but still these contact shadows will tie that to the floor. So this is like the easiest thing, and I, I would never want to start creating these complex shadows because it would look like crap anyways. It's really hard to um, make that uh, contact shadow. Sometimes you need to just, you don't have a shadow, you need to use the projection and I, I totally recommend that you read books about how the shadows are formed uh, according to light. The more you look pictures and the more you look the shadows, you start to figure out the hardness of the uh, shadow and what it does. And then you are able to kind of fine tune these also by drawing. But this is from the shadow, sh shadow point of view, just a, a quick... Um, yeah, just I'm gonna do just redo for example. I'm gonna put that to normal. So, just to quickly recap, I'm just gonna make a selection of the shadows, make a mask out of that, use levels. I'm just gonna levels, clip it more black, more white, leaving only the, the shadows. And then you, this layer goes to multiply. And then mask out all this crap here. So there's, in a way, the, the range of these. I think those are the best practices of um, doing composite images and those are the crucial things that you should look for. So I'll just show you in a way the, um, my thinking of how, how to build these um, images. Okay, let's start from, um, just going to show you how I start building these environments and now I'm taking to kind of figure out all these small steps. Okay, let's start from that. So I have already cut it. So when I'm starting to build these kind of environments, um, I have some kind of a picture in my mind that what I'm gonna build. Usually it's a sketch and then I try to find these elements that what I usually use is uh, I use Adobe Stock and the st Adobe Stock is really good because I can always search straight from the Adobe Stock library and I can just drag these images here with, with the watermark. I can, I can do all the layouts with the watermarks and then that goes to client and then when the client's happy I can just go and click, click, click and license those images and the full resolution images comes. That's why the Adobe Stock is included in inside of the um, uh, um, uh, Photoshop. So this is a really helpful tool to kind of start doing. But okay, so I'm building now an environment and my, my thinking is that I'm gonna place it in some, some fantasy world. Um, this could be my, my base picture. And from this base picture, I will need to figure out the horizon. I could follow these parallel lines here and that those would guide is this point, but you can see clearly that the horizon is somewhere around here. So I have already cut out that image. 
So I'm going to just do a bit of canvas. Uh, I'm going to just widen this image slightly like that. Just to get some room to it. So this could be my, my base. So now I can start uh, bringing in those um, images. Hold on. So let's bring first the background. So that could be, okay. I'm usually using, when I'm doing scaling, I'm using them as a smart object because it allows me to scale up and down without losing the resolution. So now, for example, if this would be my, my background here, command T to scale, um, Horizons should match. So in this picture, the horizon is around here. So I'm going to place that somewhere around here. Um, when you're doing composite images, it's really important to take few things uh, in consideration when you're pulling images from stock images and stuff like that. Um, can anyone say what is the problem with this stock image comparing to my base image? Uh, yeah, the colors are off, yes. What? Sorry? Yeah, that's two, but we're going to fix those. The direction of the light. Look where the, my light is coming from, my main image. It's, coming, it's creating shadows on this side. On this one, it's creating shadows on that side. So the thing is, I, don't, I need to flip this first. Just to match this environment where the, the light is. So these are the things that, that you should always consider the d direction of the light also. If there's a visible, clear, if it's like, like overcast uh, picture, you don't see the direction of the shadows. But again, small thing, but now that the, you know where the shadows are coming in the kind of in the same, same direction. So this would be my, okay, I'm going to aim this. And everything is aligning now because I'm using those, the, the horizons to match. So I can bring more. Let's bring, yeah, that castle. Again, from this picture, you can see that it's shot kind of a, low up since the horizon is horizon is here and when i aim the horizon to match you can see that they they match it looks kind of real i have already cut out that too we don't need to do cutting and we can kind of figure out what size i mean i'm not creating real i'm just creating something that I, in my mind, looks good. These are the things that, because I'm building environments, I'm using, I'm good at seeing stock images, what goes together. So again, that could be there. Let's bring another castle. And you can see clearly this is like off, not even close to fitting the picture. Place embedded, one more castle. Okay, well, like that. You can see the horizon is here. Let's match that. And where are we gonna put this? Let's put it maybe, maybe here. I think I'll have that isolated too. So now there's our kind of a small, weird, weird, weird uh, environment. And I can do, I'm not going to do precise, but I'm just going to do a really quick masking out of, for example, this castle. Because other, others are hidden already behind certain elements. So I'm just going to do that kind of a masking. Maybe we'll extend that sky over there. Just going to. Make a copy out of that and just
So now we need to figure out, because we have this composite in a way done. Now we start to have to figure out the, the shades, the saturation. We could also check the contrast things, but I think we concentrate now on uh, basically the, the main stuff that I just taught you. So now I don't have to worry about the size because this is my Im imagination. What size are the elements? They, they are far there and the castles, it's, you know, your, um, whatever your imagination says. People will believe it. So, so now if, when I start uh, color grading these, uh, I have to match these before I can color grade the whole image together. So let's do that. So check layer, neutral gray, luminosity, hue saturation all the way up. Now we start to see a bit of what we need to do. So I'm just going to embed those together. <coughs> so we will start, so first figure out that which is the color that you are going to match. So I'm going to use, for example, uh, this, our main castle here as a base. So I'm going to try to match these to this image here. So first I'm going to color grade this, uh, my background here that part here. So on top of that, selective color. Uh, I don't need to clip it because it's the lowest layer, but I can always clip it if, uh, if something comes under there. So neutrals, for example, you can choose where to choose uh, to start, but I usually start with neutrals. And small tweaks start to make huge change. There's a lot of in the shadows in this um, picture anyways. It has to have more black. Turning those highlights that you, you kind of see there into the orangey thing. You can just, I can put this even off so I can just better see what I'm doing and that too. So you can see that there's these darker areas are red, so you are aiming for those um, small changes in those. And something like that should be close enough. So the next one, I'm going to color grade that. That is different. Selective color, clip it, neutrals. You can start seeing how it vanishes into the. You're just trying to find similar tones in it. Let's see how was in the blacks. Should be close enough. And then the last one. I'm not gonna uh, uncheck this before I, I get all the way through, so. But you can always check that whatever is happening there. So last one, this one, selective color. Clip it, start from neutrals. There's a lot of in the uh, darker colors in this one. Whites. Start to be close enough for this. So big movement so you can see what, what is uh, doing. So let's uncheck those and see what, uh, what we did. So if you, for example, look this, this column and this background here, so they start to match. I could do a bit of fine tuning on that, that definitely, but, but if, you, if, if I would uncheck every single 
uh, layer, you would see how, how different it was. And the, now the next phase is to do the selective color. I have the preset saturation check. And now you can see, again, let's start from the same thing over again, that we will start from, just going to check. Let's do, that's the castle. I'm going to match that and that first. So I could match these, because this is the lowest saturation. Uh, seems like it, definitely. So I can actually match all these for this. So now I have this castle here. So on top of that, hue saturation, clip it. And now you can see how much I need to... If you see the contrast, uh, the black and white levels, minus 42, now they are matching. I can bring the, another castle here. That one, well, that's a huge change. Hue saturation, clip it. Over there. That castle, hue saturation, clip it. I'm going to leave actually the, that off. No, oh, that was a change actually. The slightly wrong order that this wasn't off. This was off, but I can anyways lower the saturation because my color color change changed the, also the saturation, but. Here you can see how nicely, because they were totally different colors anyways. So these, the saturation thing and then the uh, color tone, you are able to get these tones in the same world again. And then you are able to do the selective color on the whole image to tie this whole package more together. Because this is uh, the whole goal is to that you are able to match these separately, and you just build yourself your process. W which one, which is your base, which one do you match, and all the elements uh, try to match in that. But here's just an example of this uh, perspective size uh, shading and the saturation. Um, how I approach if I do an environments or uh, things like that kind of a real, real life quickly created from stock photography. Um, I could play sort of like a person over there or something like that. So, so comments. Yeah, yeah, of course, because then uh, I usually have more than, so then you have just to choose that which is your base, and then just one by one, okay, I'm going to match this, I'm going to match this, and then match the saturation, saturation, saturation. So if you have a process done, you are able to... But would you put, like, all of the pictures into the same uh, Yeah, I would do the composite, uh, composition first. Because if, um, if I... Of course, you can do it in stages too, but I would do a composite first because, uh, for example, uh, I would I I would love to see this stage first, how my composition is, of all the elements, and then start color grading. Then, okay, I need to add something, like more. Of course, I could add something here and then color grade that according to this. It, it but I try to color grade everything that I have all the elements already in the in the picture. 
and I do like a, this is this could be like a really rough sketch of mine actually because it's like a really badly masked out. But I would do a really uh, if this is a something I would do, then I would start going precisely to mask out, for example, these parts here and. But they are, anyways, lining lining um, together. Uh, so that's, in a way, in my mind, the uh, best practices, the perspective, horizon, shoot middle middle horizon. It, that's that makes your life so much easier. Extracting the shadows, the color grading of these different elements, I think it's, a, it's really important. And I, I, I assure you that if you have done any composite images that you think that they look fantastic, put those two check layers and you might different thought about that. And it feels like terrible. And then the saturation uh, check. Those are just the things that I had, had to figure out over the years that um, kind of I was forced to figure out that what is something because I cannot um, my eye is not trained to see what I need to change on the shadows or the highlights and mid tones usually I just color grade like put some warmth or just put, add some blue but now it's affecting the whole image rather than shadows highlights and mid tones separately so then we're going to do the last quick thing that you, hopefully you might um, use sometimes in your, um, in your work. I'm just going to show you. Um, so the concept of this parallax, um, for example, in this case, I'm just going to use this as an example, but you can use any still picture that you can isolate element and then draw something that is missing there uh, to replace that. Of course, I had already this backplate, so it's easy to use. Um, but for example, you might have a person standing on a, on a cliff. You just cut out that person and fill that background, maybe a content aware fill to that empty spot. And then you have a back plate without the person and then the front plate with the, with the person. So same, same here. So I have a back plate here uh, of the background. I have cut out those two happy guys drinking beer and then this um, dude and a um, waiter here. And the whole thing is to start thinking in three-dimensionally. So you know this, these are layers, but they are right on top of each other. Now you have to spread them out in a, in, in a 3D world. And the whole thing is done that when you have like spread out these layers, you're just moving a camera along in that scene, on this 3D scene. So of course, Photoshop is two-dimensional. So these are stacked on top of each other like this. So this is a PSD file that has all these three layers. So now I can go into After Effects. So um, usually I do like a HD, um, like a proper um, 1920, uh, 180 uh, P aspect ratio. Like it, this is like a typical a, uh, HD resolution. I'm just do, doing a 10 second video. This is just a composition. So when you launch After Effects, it it's basically comes to this uh, dialog. So you can choose a preset here, uh, for example, to have a, a standard HD resolution uh, video out of it. If you're doing a Facebook video or uh, Instagram video, just choose according to your size what, what you're uh, building from here. Just press OK. Uh, when I'm doing these uh, parallax, I, I'm using these 2D, two views. So if you are not uh, familiar with After Effects, I mean, do the basics first so you will understand the panels. And this is not your After Effects basics video. I'm just going to straight what 
the idea is, and you are, you are able to explore this uh, later on. But here I usually use two views that are kind of a next, uh, next to each other, because uh, I need to see my layers on top of, just to see how they are spread out in this 3D world. And then also a camera view that is looking that shows me what is happening in my. So on here in the left, you have this uh, project panel where you can import a file. So I can just import straight my parallax PSD. Um, so you are able to e uh, import this as a composition. Um, and you can just click to create co composition. So press OK. So it will ask you create composition, editable layer styles. Um, if you put these retain layer sizes, then it will look at the image of the content and make the um, size of that layer according to the content. We want to fill it the whole area that was the PSC document. So just have, uh, put it here in a composition. So this will open up uh, these files, and you can see that the layers are here separately, but it automatically cre uh, created this composition that you can drag here in this. And since this was a shot with a uh, uh, camera, it's a huge. It's like four, 6,000 pixels wide. So I need to scale this first just to see everything here. S, S to scale, and then I just scale this to fit my viewport. So. Now these elements are not 3D yet. So now that's because though both view, even though this is a top view and this is a, like a um, main camera view, they are the same. So I double click the uh, composition and it will open up these layers. And here's this, uh, this kind of a 3D cube sign and you check every single one of these. And now you can see from the top view, you are looking at these layers on top of, and they are in a one, it's, it's a line basically, because they are exactly on top of each other. Then what we need here is a camera, and camera is a virtual camera that moves in this 3D world. Uh, right click, new camera, you can choose the millimeters that, uh, it, it, usually it doesn't matter, I usually use 24 millimeter camera that I place in the scene. So now you can see here that here's a top view. There's a camera looking on that angle on these three layers that are exactly on top of each other. And that's the representation. It will. So the goal is now to make a, dist a bit of distance in this 3D world. One layer here, one layer here, third layer here. And then we're going to move a camera in this. And that will create this parallax effect. Looks like there's a depth in this. So first, background, you can see the blue arrow here. So I'm just going to click that. That's in the Z axel that goes that way. Just going to drag that. You can see now from the camera, it's getting away from the camera. That's why it's getting smaller. So I'm going to place it there. But this is not how I, it's supposed to be. Now I have to scale it back to fit the frame. So S for scale. And then I'm just going to scale this. So from my camera, it will look normal again. Then the guys, you can see it's selected. The guys will move in the Z axis back. Again, scale and I'm going to scale them also back to normal. And the, this guy will be, be the same. So now I have this camera here, and I can move now the camera on this axle, and this will create this parallax effect. You can see. So this is the basics of the, uh, these parallax um, movies. You can twist and turn. If I would like to start from, from example, uh, from these guys from here, I can just make a keyframes 
from this point, pull the com camera back and maybe here. So this is just, a, you know, the uh, basics of, so I can just make a keyframe for actually from here. So I'm just going to, let's just figure out. So I'm gonna go to these guys first, zoom in here. I'm just gonna place here, transform, point of interest and position, click those. Those are keyframes in zero seconds and in five seconds, let's say, I'm gonna pull the camera back and then to the side, for example. So now I have an animation of this. And you can see that how the parallax works. You're kind of faking the depth of still images. That's the basic, basic thinking of uh, behind these parallax th things. And you can do, um, Definitely cool stuff with the still images. And this is just uh, um, something to think of when you learn this technique and know how to still images. From our company is doing a lot of these because uh, we, we started to do and made it brand them like they're moving images. People are sending us like old images uh, from like a, a business stories that you are able to do. We just cut them out, fill the background with uh, content overfill or something like that, and then you are able to move and create stories f from still images, old still images. And if you want to go further, you can use even a puppet wrap. You know, the, you can turn the hands the same way. For example, this guy, uh, guys in the front here, I could use the puppet wrap if I would like to. To bend things. For example, if I would do a keyframe from the head coming from here to here, or here, or here. So it's just animating these things and, you know, a that just gives away this, uh, that, okay, it's a still frame, but it's moving. And hopefully this will, you know, um, in YouTube you'll find a lot of, uh, with this parallax thing, you'll uh, find in-depth videos. But the whole concept is this, that you split your images into layers, put it in a 3D world, and move a camera along this um, world that you see here. That's a top-down view. So I think I have covered basically all that I was super thinking to cover. Um, this will be, these techniques that I showed uh, will be on the video and these guys will del del deliver in the website. But this is also, I have my own uh, full master class called Digital Artist Master Class. It's eight hours of everything that I know about basically being a digital artist from creativity to the marketing side. So take a screenshot of that um, if you want. Uh, I put it in a minus 50% discount uh, only for you for this week. And if you go to the website, you will see all the contents that is, is included. So, um, and there's these techniques and plenty more of what, what, what you need to be a digital artist. So, so if you're interested, uh, take a look of, of that. And, I think that will conclude my thing.